Hello, good to meet you. I was always really immersed in the law, even as a kid. I had like three or four white dwarves initially, and I used to pore over those. I would reread them constantly. When I first started doing YouTube, it was really for just for fun as a hobby. I think these days, many people start with the intention of, I want this to be a full-time situation. I think law and just the stories can be genuinely pretty motivational. Painting is a very good thing for people's mental health because you really have to focus and it's very sort of relaxing. Unpopular opinion actually, but I do think probably one of the best places to start is actually just the Hello everyone and welcome to this very special episode of the Paint Perspective podcast presented to you by the team here at Siege Studios. We have a fantastic guest lined up for you today, none other than the lawmaster himself, Lutin09. We're going to be talking about all things Warhammer 40k law, best places for you to start if you are a beginner or if you're a fan of other existing franchises or if you're a painter and you're looking to broaden your horizons within the Warhammer hobby. Stay tuned, we've got a great episode lined up for you. So we've, uh, we've painted a, a knight army for you. Yeah, pretty significant one, actually. <laughs> yeah, what's the background on that for the, uh, for the listeners? Um, the background for it was that years ago, I discovered that actually there is a planet in 40K called the Luton Necropolis, which was pretty astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I decided to sort of obviously explore this. It's from the uh, story Death Wolf, uh, which deals with uh, the Space Wolves dealing with some Drakari on the planet there. It's like an incursion on the planet. But there's not much uh, expansion on what actually the world is or the hive specifically and the details there. There is some world building, but it's like a short, it's like a, a Space Marine Battles, so it's quite a short one. I remember those books. They're really good. Yeah. And uh, so I just thought it'd be fun to have some headcanon to that, some some sort of fan fictional element to it to sort of just imagine. Um and the vehicle for doing that will be through the House Luton Knights. So that's. I'm that's sure the Space Wolves would be very appreciative of a night, <laughs> a night house to fight some, some, some tricksy Dark Elder. So, yeah. Sure, sure. How convenient for that to just be like stumbling across some lawyers. So, oh, it turns out my name's just uh, yeah. very conveniently already written in. It is literally like winning the 40K lottery. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. It was very weird. I cross referenced a lot to try and <laughs> make sure it wasn't an error or something. It was very strange. <laughs> the only annoying thing is in the, like with so many audio dramas, like trying to pronounce Robute uh, Gilliman, yeah. um, it, it, they don't pronounce it quite. Luton, it's he does go with like a, a Luton or something yeah. curious like that. Right. But I'm used to people getting my name wrong anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. you know, so. That's, that's well, good. It's, and so obviously the color scheme is—is is that just to fit your uh, your channel? It fits the logo, yeah, so yeah. black and gold, and then some white elements in there. But I tried to design it so that it led more with a color, a specific like sort of unifying color, because it's obviously close to Hawk Shroud, and yeah. I didn't want. To, you know, if you looked at it offhand, you think, oh, it's a nice Hawk Shroud army. But it's <laughs> yeah. like, I did get confused because we actually had a, a, Hawk, a, a Hawk Shroud army that we was painting for a client in at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And I was looking at them both on the shelf and I was like, wait, is this the loot? No, it's the loot. <laughs> <one." laughs> they have a slightly more gold, like uh, a more yellow to orange gradient. And I got some custom decals done as well. Yeah. And all that sort of thing. So, yeah. Lovely, those decals. Are really, they, uh, they're really good, yeah. actually. Yeah, the little spires are quite Scumbag cool. Scumbag customs. Yeah, they're quite good. Yeah, they're really, <laughs> it was really good. funny on the with the mix-up of the two. Like we had the, the Hawkshard army and we had the your ones because we were like, obviously work into a bit more. We wanted to work with you in terms of like when we were going to post them. And it was we we're very careful about that. Whereas with our client ones, it's just like once they're done, we post them. So it was like putting two almost exactly the same armies next to each other on a tray in front of George and going, you're not allowed to post these ones. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mix, <laughs> don't mix them up. You're not allowed to post these ones. You can post these ones. It was just like a bit of a test, but we, uh, the, we thing, done it. the thing is the perfect harmony will be because they are your own custom night house. You can use whatever night house rules you want when the yeah. codex yeah exactly but conveniently i when, usually when, don't do that but in this instance it no you can but but when hawk shroud is top of the meta you're mm -hmm. laughing it's bad enough then it's a night army to start with let alone yeah. worrying about meta at all yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. what about the we done previously we've done next the Necrons, army, yeah. Yeah, the Necrons, was ago, the Necron right? army was the biggest one you guys have done. Other than that, it's been like specific smaller things, smaller like, bits and like bobs, yeah. Inquisitor and stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah the uh, the Necron force is another. Actually, yeah, I was saying I don't do a custom army, but the Necrons is another custom. Is army. I was going to say, well, that's kind of what I was going to go into because, like, where did the thought process behind that custom scheme come from? Was that purely visuals, or is there? It was some mainly kind visuals. Of... I I do have like a rough. Uh, 
draft of like a head canon law with that. And I think I will get into doing that because I do want to do a big video which shows off the Necrons and so forth. But there's a few other models that I want to get done myself before I do that. Yeah. Um, but they will have like, yeah, custom law for themselves, like head canon law that I just that I've put together. Um, but that was mainly a visual thing. I really, as much as like the green, the black, the silver is so, um, you know, classic for the Necrons because it's their main sort of color scheme. Um, some of the others are really interesting. And I think the Necrons, uh, as a force are so visually interesting. Like, you know, it, it's worth doing other things with it. And that's why I wanted to go with, you know, the orange energy crystals instead of the green and, yeah, and yeah. just try and have like a different color scheme going across the body. And they're kind of like tinted my force, you know, yeah, yeah. it's some of the Necron, they, they, the, they have very straight patterns, very clear markings and stuff. Mine, I wanted to have more gradation and tint to them, which they do in that force. And it works really well. It was difficult to work. We were, I was going to say we, we went we went through several iterations. We went back and forth. Obviously, I think we had you had loads of ideas and stuff, and and I, you had some great ideas of colors and ways to shift them and stuff like that. And I think when getting to the orange to blue worked really well because they because they complement each other really well. It's really similar to this. This seems like it's going to be the night episode by the looks of it. But that orange and blue is exactly the same reason why I chose those for my night army because they contrast so well. Yeah. So, but but the thing is, is you've got that lovely metallic, which sort of like just adds obviously that metallic effect to the orange and blue as well so it's a nice combination of those those glazed on colors and then obviously the metallic underneath as well um so it's really it was really fun actually we actually i think we have we have on the channel an old showcase of those necrons if we do, yeah. to go and see them. It's, it's still one of our most most viewed videos i think yeah everyone kind of was uh loves your scheme wowed by some of the color scheme. i think the biggest model wasn't it the triarch um, the triarch, yeah. yeah, that's the most I think, impressive was that, one. It's that really was, was that standing really on the right That was a second. Did we do a second yeah. lot? Yeah. So yeah. That, I, I don't think that's in that video potentially, no. but there might be another video with it. Yeah, yeah it was like stepping over a rhino yeah, or stepping on, on black, a rhino black, or something like that. Was rhino. That, that, is, rhino. that was a particularly cool, was a really uh, cool model. way of doing that, I think. Yeah, no, yeah. that was good. That was and really I think cool. that force, the more I got, I wanted it to be quite infantry heavy because often Necron forces, you can go in on really specific powerful units because that's what they are. But I wanted to have that feel of you know, the Necron warriors coming out of a tomb and, and, and more. The undying was, legion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. it may not be that obviously if you're building a list, you would necessarily go with that, but it just looks visually interesting as a force and then you can pick and choose what you want to use, you know. Yeah, it gives you the scope to do lots of things with it if you do a game with it as well. Which yeah, is good. and that scheme was quite forgiving, I think, as well mm -hmm. with the gradations and stuff like, you know, when you're doing lots and lots of warriors, it's you know, it doesn't have to all be the same and you can get through it quite quickly, actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you're on a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission using the code PAINT5. Back to the show. Do you do a lot of gaming then, I'm guessing? Basically? No. No, <laughs> <laughs> this is my big thing every year i say right this is the year i'm going to get back into it you know i did obviously used to years ago when i first started getting into 40k played loads for many years and really enjoyed and then over time you know just took a break from it really got into other areas took a break from 40k for some years um as everyone does everyone the, that's like the tradition yeah, when we tradition. get a guest on is they yeah. tell us about the gap they took the gap, yeah. we might, that <laughs> might as well be the first question we ask a guest any how part long of, when was the gap when was the gap yeah how yeah. old were you how long did it last it was usually when i when i uh i guess when i first got my my first sort of proper job and I'd moved away from home and I was like, I'm focused on doing this now. Mm. I didn't really have time for other things. And you're sort of in that kind of, you know, in your twenties going out and doing stuff. And, you know, mm. what was it Adam Skinner said he discovered beer and women. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get to 30 and you're like, Oh, there's time for some hobbies. now. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess everyone knows you for, for the law side of things mostly. Um, yeah. What, what was your sort of intro into, into 40k then? Was it just the gaming or was it the painting and miniatures? The intro to 40K for me was the miniatures um, because I was quite young. I guess I was 10, maybe. Uh, and I remember at school, people were just swapping around models, these little models. You know, I don't know. I don't even remember why people were swapping them, but it was, <laughs> it, I, I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it was from like, a, yeah, it would have been similar to that. Yeah. And it, and it was like the Space Crusade models and yeah, some yeah. of the very early um, white metal miniatures, some Terminators and stuff. And, 
the other guys had these models. I didn't know what they were. Um, but I was like, damn, these are really cool. I'm really interested in these. And, you know, and from there, and I think some people just kind of give me a few models. And I think I've said before, like, there's a sort of nostalgia in the um, Space Marine Terminator with the Cyclone Missile Launcher. Great model. It just triggers like an endorphin release in my brain <laughs> every time. I see a Space Marine Terminator with a Cyclone missile launcher. It's just embedded in me yeah. uh, from that age. And I, I, there's something super awesome about that model. It just looks really cool. I'm pretty know. sure even me, as we've like we've we've discussed many times in this podcast, how me and George don't necessarily fall into the 90s nostalgia the way that James does. However, I'm pretty sure even I have one of those Terminators <laughs> yeah. at home somewhere. I'm actually glad you're here, Luton, because I, I've needed some serious OG backup. Yeah. Because no, they, these two, I, if you've watched recent episodes, I've been I've been fighting that fight on the hill no, on my own. I've been and, getting a fair amount of flack uh, lately, yeah. so it's your turn. <laughs> so, so I'm you glad you're to, here. You need to understand what it was like playing back in those days when you would touch the edge of the table, half your models would fall over. And because they were so heavy, every single arm would break off. That yeah. is the it real. is still actually a shock to me because now and then we do get like some of the older models in like the white metal ones especially and like when mm. i when i pick them up it, i'm like it, it's jarring you could kill somebody with it's, a dreadnought i'm pretty sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um yeah the metal ones do bring back a lot of um nostalgia especially when they come in mm. um but it just shows how it shows how sort of like how how people still hugely value them like and yeah. people still want to get them painted which i think is great mm. so what was um, your first sort of army that you got into them it would have been space marines mm. because, of course, be. of course. because of course because of course um <laughs> But, Why but, do I ask? <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing, though, is, and we've thought about this so much, the way people get into and learn the hobby now is so significantly different from back then, um, mainly because, you know, there was no internet, really. You know, nobody's doing that kind of thing. Uh, there's no resources for painting other than White Dwarf. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck reading a few paragraphs of, yeah. you know, how to thin your paints and brush control and this, you know, that's written very vaguely. And you're trying as a kid who has no experience in painting models, you've got a couple of paragraphs in White Dwarf and that's it, basically. Mm -hmm. And then there's no, there's a process of like, you know, base, layer, but again, very, very rough. You didn't even really fully understand what that meant when no, you read it. Yeah. No, you could see it, but somehow you didn't we've process kind of, it. Um, we've kind of touched on that before. I'll put a link to the episode that we did, but we, because all three of us, got into painting at different times. Mm. Um, and George only started painting for the first time and got into Warhammer within the last, like, what? Four, five, four or five years? Four years or something. So if you get into Warhammer for the first time four years ago, yeah, it is so drastically different. Well, I remember getting into Warhammer listening to, listening to your videos. Four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think you see it. I see people on social media who are brand new to painting the models and obviously stuff like contrast and systems and stuff like my little cousin who was seven or eight years old, his mum took him into Games uh, games Workshop, a Warhammer shop, um, and he painted his first Space Marine. And I was like, bloody hell, like he's painted that really well. But he used contrast and, he did, da, 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 and they, gu they guided him through it in the store. Well, yeah. when I was a kid, they didn't really do yeah, that. No. And some of those systems were less forgiving with the paints. They were, yeah, know? definitely. And they and you definitely looked up to store managers. like, like they had, They'd have like their own models of stuff in the cabinets and stuff. And you'd like, oh, wow. Like I really want to yeah. really want to kind of paint like that and stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's it. I didn't understand how to do edge highlighting. No. I would always go to the Games Workshop store and look in the window and I'd see, you know, you think like, well, logically you would just think, well, you drew a line there. Somehow that never clicked in my head as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Like I never understood like, <laughs> oh, I just need to draw a little line on I the models. Remember. I was always like, how have they done this? Yeah. I remember thinking like, no, it can't just be that. And there's no way I can ever yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. If it was just as simple as just drawing a line, surely everyone would be doing it. It can't be that. But yeah. then it turns out it is that. It's just you've got to be very, Which is, very refined with the, it. The interesting thing as well was that my original Ultramarines, Space Marines, uh, because I my force was Ultramarines, but as I've had, I got a lot of stick for that. Is when I, with that? When I, when I told no, people you know that what? on the channel. I actually, I actually like respect it. If people are just... Un unashamedly I'm going with the poster boys the thing I'm is going though with the poster boys I respect it when I got into 40k they were not the poster boys no actually you're right at the time in the second edition 40k if you go back and look at the material go back and look at the white dwarf the ultramarines were not on everything then no they weren't maybe they leaned a little bit more 
But yeah, well, it, 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 it was there was as much blood angels I remember. There was yeah. a lot of blood angels. It, it, but back then, like I do agree with you totally. Like I think there's a, there's a, there were a lot in between sort of like Rogue Trader and Second Edition. There was a lot of like individual box releases. There was like uh, like a Space Marine box. There was like a all the, yeah Dark Millennium. But all those boxes had different kind of cover arts. And and even if you remember the uh, the, the the Scarface uh, the Scarface one that it's they're Dark Angels in that. So um so there's 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 a lot. And you mentioned Dark Millennium. That was Dark Angels on the front of that as well. So they they did. They did. Um, they did use a lot of chapters back then. I, don't, I, I can't remember. I think obviously second was was Blood Angels, but I can't remember when. Black Templars after yeah, that. Yeah, Black I Templars think. was third, third edition. So I, I, it must be around about fourth. That nobody I, I knew had Imperial Fists because trying to paint, <laughs> trying to paint uh, Imperial Fists yeah. with sunburst yellow. Yeah, no. yeah not, not, it's not. funny the things like you maybe. I wonder if that's something to explore. Like the the myths that you hear when you start painting. Uh, I reckon they're different now. Yeah, to what yeah. they used to be because it used to be like I think oh, yellow is stuck oh, around. Don't want to don't want to paint white. You don't want to paint yeah. yellow stuff like that. But I feel like that's a bit more doable and accessible. I feel now. like it's not as true now, but the rumor is stuck. The rumors stayed there. Yeah, yeah. people the just scared of it for no reason. The other reason I had Ultramarines was very straightforward. My brother did angels, so he had blood angels and dark angels. My other mate had space wolves. And nobody wanted to do Imperial Fists ever. So I was like, well, I'll do Ultramarines. So what, <laughs> that you're, was it. what you're saying is when you got the, you got the short straw, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I, I Although in the long run, you ended up with like the most the most. My, my Ultramarines one. army is kind of bonkers. It's not finished because obviously nothing is finished when it comes to 40k. I've got plenty on the shelf. <laughs> but of the painted models, it's like 7,000 points or something. Like, like you that. got Region a lot of Ultras. It, it's, yeah, you, know. you have a lot of Ultras. I'm interested then. How, how did the shift go from like the miniatures and the painting to the lore? Again, after I'd had that break, but I was always really immersed in the law, even as a kid, like the second edition rule book and the war gear book and the Imperialist book. I love those codex. books. Yeah. The artwork in those, it was all the classic artwork, you know, the sort of black and white, you know, illustrations. And they really were pulling. I think one of them was like a really interesting changer of the ways mm -hmm. or at least a sort of space marine demon. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's that one where it's this guy has kind of like a, looks almost like an animal skull as a head and he's sort of standing to the side and uh, that image and it's got like all this scrying sort of demon symbols all over him uh, that just really pulled me in as, as a kid like a lot of that artwork as well again you know I think I've had conversations with people about sort of you know especially with YouTube as well sort of what is appropriate in terms of horror and stuff like that you know because 40k is pretty can be pretty horrific yeah um but conversations i've had with youtube in the past is like look a kid can go into a warhammer store and look at these books like you know yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. and and as a kid I, you know kids kids love that sort of dark side of things you know like when i was a kid reading those books you really pulled into the you yeah know, learn reading the 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 descriptions of the harlequin's kiss and you're like that's pretty horrifying like yeah. it's i love that as a kid i was like yeah liquidized them on the inside <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so I was really into the law even as a kid, but again, I think what pulls you in when I was first getting to 40 K when I was like 11, 12 years old, something like this, again, that we didn't have all the resources we had now. So what did you have? Just white dwarf. Mm -hmm. I had like three or four white dwarves initially, and I used to pour over those. I would reread them constantly. And so some of the law would just really you know pull you in and immerse you completely and, and stay with you um was that and, from like the book like the the lore and sort of fluff in the codexes or was you sort of drawn to novels early on or? there wasn't really novels early on there weren't a uh, black library like it wasn't around i don't, I don't even remember when black library started you, you had what you had when you yeah i don't remember no when actually it I, black library started with the uh with the um the Warhammer, do you remember the cartoons, the uh, the cartoon magazines they used to release on all oh, the yeah. weekly? Black yeah. Library started with that, and, then they, and then they released full books yeah. of the of the of all the cartoons in one book. What was they? the year of the first heresy book? Uh, I can't remember what the first year was. It's not that year. long ago, is it, the first yeah. heresy book? First, no, the first heresy book well, isn't ages, but they used to do, they used to do uh, Warhammer Monthly, which was a... I think it was once a month they used to release uh, Horse a... Rising 2006. Wow. Okay. I was alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but one a monthly was. Yeah, like don't a, you was, remember, George? Come on. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was a, a monthly, almost comic book, and it used to have like two, three pages for each story, and then that was Black Library. That's what. I was, so Inferno. Uh, Inferno was out at the same time. I think Inferno was out before. 
And I don't know if that was Marcus's Black Library. Someone, someone in the comments can, can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But um, but I remember Warhammer Monthly was the first thing because from Warhammer Monthly, they made they took all the stories once they've been released and made individual books. Yeah. So like, did like an omnibus. Well, it was, like, it was the full story just in one book. Like yeah. Blood Quest was like, well, obviously. Blood St Quest still even book. now though, and this is my thing always with like going back and like cross-referencing stuff. There are a lot of references to things, whether it's Titans, for example. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to the White Dwarfs when they were talking about like epic Armageddon and stuff like this. And the only reference to some of the details about Titans is still in the White Dwarfs. They haven't really brought it forward. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back to all those white dwarves, which is helpful if you have them. So, <laughs> I do, yeah. So he's looking at me like, oh, yeah. you've seen the archive. Yeah, 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 the library. Same, isn't yeah. It? yeah. The library downstairs. Yeah. But yeah, they used to in White Dwarf tell a lot of the lore. So I think in one of the White Dwarves I had, they really laid out the whole lore of the Ultramarines from Rabuti Gilliman and where it started and all that stuff. And yeah, pages and pages and pages of the lore went into White Dwarf. Um, I remember the, I remember the, there was a series of white dwarfs in a row where they covered all the assassins. Yeah. So there was all the different assassins. They'd have two, three pages describing all the assassins. And actually, even now, that is pretty much the most substantial source of the assassins' lore, really. You know, yeah. I don't know where else you would find it other than those old white dwarfs, really. No, you're right. Yeah. And and like even do you remember the series Index of Starties where yeah. they talk about individual chapters in white dwarfs? Yeah. I always yeah. thought that was a great little. Was, uh, they were including that the information about the chapters in there as well, like the heraldry and like maybe yeah. the odd character or, or whatever. And there was always a little story about a specific yeah thing as well. They'd often write short stories, little narrative elements within that stuff. And there's a lot of that stuff that I don't think has been brought forward from those old white dwarves. You know, there's still I think there's still a lot of value in those white dwarves. And I think the only place you could, you know, you can obviously find the white dwarves on can I say eBay or anything yeah, like you that? Can you can say find it. But um, other than that, it's Warhammer Plus because they've been steadily releasing. I was going to say about that. Yeah, they're going to they're like sort of backdating, releasing it, the archives, yeah. aren't they? Scanning yeah. them in or whatever. So yeah. that's the one good way to I, go I, back I, through old them. I love having, I mean, I've got a massive white dwarf collection, but I, I love having that because being able to look back and then see all those things from the childhood and then like you, you'll see like you'll find like a page with the first instance of something now that's very prominent and everywhere, if mm. that makes sense. Like, like Admech, for example, Admech, when they yeah. came out, like it was this massive thing. And then you, the only place to find anything about Mechanicum was 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 was, was back in the day in white dwarfs and stuff before there was even a range for it. The, the other problem you used to have painting stuff, and this was a big problem I remember now, was they didn't used to be a resource where it would show you a model in different variations. So from what I remember, the Cyclone Missile Launcher Terminator in White Dwarves, because I think I looked it up a few months back, I think in the old White Dwarves, it's only shown in Blood Angels and nothing else. Yeah, I, th I think So you right. have to kind of guesstimate like what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, only, yeah. the only time you'd see it in different colors is when they had like staff member armies as like yeah. articles and then you'd see how they'd painted the models. Yeah. Um because they did that big one in one of the white doors where they did like the whole Ultramarines chapter. Yeah, just chapter. But that was, was the that, whole that, chapter. That, well that was from when they done a games day where they got all mm. the shops to paint models for it. Yeah, that's right. Um, I remember. But uh but yeah, that was this you're right, right. Like so doors. trying to find a lot of stuff back in the day was you would go off the artwork mainly. Mm. You'd look at artwork like, you know, some of the, the the classic pictures, the box art and stuff like that for orcs and things like this, you know. You just kind of have to guesstimate it, basically. Yeah, so. yeah. So you're into it when you're young, and then you see how to gap, like you say. So when you got back into it, how does that segue into starting this YouTube channel that you've become now? When I first started doing YouTube, it was really for just for fun as a hobby, um, trying to help out other friends of mine who were doing gaming and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'll just make some guides about this or about that. Really sort of sharing gameplay with each other and that kind of thing. And over time, it gained some traction and it did better and better. And I thought, oh, you know, some people are liking this. I guess I'll just keep making it, you know, with no real idea of an end goal or anything like that. Um, and then over time, there were sort of different communities which sort of reached out to me. There were, they used to be sort of like basically middle managers for YouTube channels. So you don't need that now, but they used to be, it was a big thing. And so they would try and find creators and bring them on board because that's how the, the process used to work. And so that kind of introduced me. They kind of like guided you towards where you were going, but it wasn't like some big goal that I had. And, um, you know, I think these days many people start with the intention of, I want this to be a full-time situation. Same with streaming, you know, a lot of people, you know, some people do that for fun but a lot of people do go into it because they want to do it as a thing you know um 
And for myself, uh, over the years, I mainly was doing video games. That's what I enjoyed. That's what I spent all my time doing. And Warhammer was a thing that, you know, I'd done previously. And I still did do it, you know, I st- but it was for fun. I wasn't were getting you, were involved. You back in-, in, were you back in the hobby by then when you were doing these gaming videos? Yeah, I guess so. But not in a public way. Sure. It would have been just painting for myself. Just by- I was going back to models that I had from years ago and thinking, oh, I never finished this. I should get back on that. And then I started reading back through all the old books. And I did go to like Warhammer shops and I bought like the new edition. I think it would have been like the uh, seventh edition uh, box That's of rule dark, books and stuff. Dark, dark Angels, dark and, angels uh, and Chaos. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Dark yeah. Engines. Yeah. So I did that. Um, and then I think it was when Eighth came along because eighth was such a big deal. And I had been sort of, I think that's what triggered me. I, I'd, I'm curious, I'd need to go back and look at the time where I made my Emperor video. That was the first video I did. Um, and when eighth came along, it's such a significant thing. It's such a huge change. It kind of re-inspired me to sort of revisit 40k and want to kind of get back into it in a bigger way. I'd sort of been, you know, just tootling along doing it myself in my own time. And I was like, oh, this thing is happening. I think it blew me away actually because 40k had been always so stagnant, not not meaning that in a negative way. No, no, no. It just know. sort of the law didn't really move forward for a long, long, long time. And when eighth came along, suddenly it was like, wow things are happening Primaris, it yeah. kind of blew my mind yeah you know yeah. so that that it wasn't just Primaris. it was just the fact that it was moving forward at all it's like know? a whole new step yeah. forward in the story wasn't it because obviously yeah. when Primaris came along at the beginning it was a very split opinion you know yeah, yeah these days people seem much more fine with it but when it first happened like people were obviously whoa this is too much you know um but 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 i was just happy that anything was happening with the law um but the the, the reason i started doing uh, the videos for 40k was um, I really, I'd reached a point on the channel where I've been doing video games for a long time and it was all fine, but I thought, oh, it would be fun to introduce something that I've always enjoyed, mm-hmm. always known about. And this will be a great way to sort of share that and and see what kind of response I get. And also just kind of open people to it maybe because at the time I think I was like aware or you could feel that many people sort of didn't really know what Warhammer was, you know. They'd seen the Games Workshop and walked by and seen stuff, but they didn't, you know. Well, I think now, like with, especially with your videos and channels like yours, that's how a lot of people, and like you've got the TV shows and the the video games obviously as well. I think a lot of people now, like surely more so than ever, just enjoy 40K in that way. I'm sure there's a lot of people who just watch your videos and listen to the law and that's it. They'll never pick up the paintbrush. I think there are always many avenues though. And Mm. I think whatever route you find into 40k or warhammer or sigma or whatever it is whatever route you find yourself in whether you start with the law or start with the painting or you know you've got a friend who plays the games and he's like oh come along and check this out you know whatever route you find yourself in that's your primary thing for a good amount of time but then you inevitably end up branching off whether it's two three four years down the line you know Everybody ends up with an army, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whether they thought they would or not. You know, like, not, it might not be painted. It might just be, it might, <laughs> yeah, might be in the boxes still the boxes on the still, shelf. Yeah. I, always, that we want. Yeah. I always see the comments on the channel that are like, I'm really into the law, but I'm never going to get an army. I'm like, yeah, come back to me in three or four <laughs> yeah. years. I'm quite good at remembering sort of people's usernames and stuff. And I swear, I've seen people say that. And then two years later, they leave a comment like, I'll just put my first army. I'm like, I remember this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually, it's funny now because YouTube allows you to... If click on a comment and view any comments that that channel's like previously left on your channel yeah, you so can you can and literally track. track that you could screenshot yeah. uh two years ago oh they have got to pay to two years later like oh, i've just bought my full for army yeah definitely <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna say like you mentioned it but that that emperor video like i think that is a i've got to say this like that's one of the things that i really really in the early days before we kind of got to know each other really well like i think that's one of the things that really kind of really interested me about your channel because like you picked a topic which as a character like there's not really like a unifying kind of bit of information other than maybe the bit in the imperialis book from second edition um there's that famous photo of him on the hill where he looks very young and he's not yeah. his, you know that 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 kind of stuff and like that as a topic like the first video it's quite a quite a it's quite a everest of topics to Undertake. Did you say that was your first that, that video vi- as well? That video was seven years ago. I think I did do a short video before that where it was just about sort of what are space marines or something, uh, just as a kind of abstract, you know, discussion. But that was seven years ago, the Emperor video, which makes it 2016. How established was the channel as a video gaming channel at that point? I think I was at 100K or something over. So it was it, a so fairly established. I think like, I was doing all right. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean, 
I had, I think I had, yeah, 2016. Yeah. So I think uh, it was around a year after that, that I left my job or something. So yeah. I think it was so a significant enough while, audience that you it was like a consideration to introduce like another topic that was sort of concern of yeah, the fan base. And well, that's, that's kind of what I was going to get at was like, if the audience is big enough, it then becomes, it's almost like it's, it's riskier to change the yeah. bigger the audience is because the more chance you've got of people going, what the hell is this? I don't, I'm not interested in this. I, I, I talked to many, many, many friends and just other people I know in the gaming space or YouTube or Twitch or whatever. And people always just kind of, you know, some, some peers who have like got already established channels that are very big and, you know, you chat about this and about that and other people that are coming up. And I always want to be like, talk to people that are, you know, starting and getting into things and try and just give some advice if you can because when i started doing it there was nobody like yeah. i just had to try and find my way which is why it took me such a long time <laughs> to like get any get anywhere with the channel but but even then you know looking back to my own thoughts about um decisions i made and it's like i think i had for the longest time in my mind this idea that well i'm i feel good about the content that i'm making so you know if i just keep chomping away at it eventually it will sort of do better and better mm -hmm. you know it'll just you, you'll eventually just find more and more of an audience but i think sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not true like i remember getting stuck on a thousand views per video for years like it was just and i probably at the time should have thought more about how can i expand out mm -hmm. but like i say it wasn't really uh, i wasn't really too concerned about it i wasn't looking to like push myself to grow at that time very early on with the channel because i was just doing it for fun on the side so it didn't really matter to me whether the channel was you know, growing super strong or anything. I didn't really have that drive. You know? How big was the initial sort of reaction to that Emperor video when it launched? Yeah, the, it, 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 it went caught, nuts from what I remember. It caught me off guard a little bit. I think it was more of a slow burn to begin with, but over time, you know, but again, I think there wasn't so many channels around doing that kind of thing at that time. There was a, maybe three or four, I guess, on YouTube that I remember. Um, but I think again, it wasn't really, again, it was just, it was just an experiment for me on the channel. Um, because you do that from time to time. It's a good thing to do on a YouTube channel or a live stream. You have to change things up from time to time, throw in another live stream is much more so, you know, you can have a live stream channel where they're focused on one game, but most often they're kind of more variety. They'll play a game for sort of a month or two and then move on to another thing. And YouTube channels do tend to be more focused on one thing. Um, but I've spoken to people at YouTube who are like, it's quite interesting how you move from video games to this. And they're like, we haven't seen too many people do that. It's not very common that you have a, ch a YouTube channel which changes completely like the sort of whole content. genre shift. I've like, done it yeah. like three times because I started doing just FPS gameplay like with Battlefield. Then I switched to Armor, which was like military sim tactical and kind of, but there's a narrative element to the to the sort of missions I used to do in Armor. I used to really enjoy the narrative element. Mm -hmm. I think over time I've just, become more interested in stories and that kind of thing and narrative and you know that's mm. where i'm going with myself now i just find i find telling stories interesting i like telling stories so uh, the one thing i would say is that that that, that emperor video obviously got a lot of attention because it was i don't think it's just the topic but i also think it's the way that you you do your videos which is something that i've always from 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 obviously we work together now but like before we did and before obviously I, we, we knew each other etc like watching your videos that it's clear the effort and the sort of like the 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 fact finding that you do to get your make your sure. videos what they are like it's not like you're just taking something that's on lexicanum or whatever and you're just you know just dictating that or whatever it's literally you go in and you look at the you find the source material which i think personally shows the the, the respect and the care and attention that you put to the law and narrative as well which i think wiki, is really wikis are really good they're like a, a helpful tool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but like really you need to go and find the source material yeah. because it's surprising how often like context doesn't come across properly mm -hmm. or very, very small details, which can be relevant or not correct or whatever. So you have to go back and really look at it to check. But you know, when you're making a video that's like an hour or an hour and a half, like you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> it happens. You know, How much prep goes into a video like that? Like in terms of with that one, especially, I guess, as, as it was one of your first ones, ones doing that. That, that, okay. The Emperor video took me like, a very long time because it was the first one I did. And I, I just did it on the side. I was obviously working full time, I think at the time as well. So I was just, it took me like six months probably, but that wow. was just like six yeah. months. But, but, it wasn't but, like one afternoon. You was like, Oh, fancy making yeah. a video. <laughs> I <laughs> I just, quick it, it was on the side of other things. So I was just doing a little bit here, a little bit there, just sort of coming back to it time and again, and just thinking, Oh, you know, how can I do this or whatever? I, so, I actually, in fairness, there's like, I feel like that is 
a genre on YouTube within itself of these like long form videos where like you get certain channels, you, you actually do upload fairly regularly, but you get <laughs> well, certain. Some channels. people would disagree about that. I would say for what you put out and the types of videos that you do, that is actually, you are fairly regular. I would say at this point, like it usually takes me like a week to do a script and then a uh, three or four days to edit i mean well, what, what i'm getting at is like how many how, how many videos a month do you upload roughly like two a couple yeah like two <laughs> something like that like to me for heavily scripted long form youtube videos there are plenty of channels out there that literally release one video every six months because that's the amount of effort that goes into making that video so like i think you say in six months on the the emperor one especially as it being like the first one it's not that much of a, oh my God, especially you were doing it part time. Like even that sounds like, I don't know, it just tracks to me. Like it's like, oh yeah, fair enough for how good the video is. I think with YouTube, there are different formats that work and trying to just go in on long form videos straight out of the gate. I don't know if that would work. I sort of transitioned to it, you know, like I was doing two, three, four, five videos a week when I was doing more video games content. And that's generally how those channels kind of work. You upload every day, you know, it's 15, 20 minute video and you showcase whatever and you're talking about whatever. That's kind of how that works. And that's the cycle. You know, you keep on that. That's how you, ha that's how the channel works. Um, transitioning to a channel where you're doing one or two videos or three videos a month, that's kind of tricky because it's also a big investment. Like if one of your videos falls flat and doesn't do well, I mean, that's, that's yeah. not good. That's not good. You know, uh, whereas if you're churning out like five, six videos a week, well, if one of them absolutely falls flat and doesn't do well, or it just does kind of mid, it's not the end of the world because you just keep banging out content. Um, but if it's one or two videos per month, you need to make sure it hits. And that can be really stressful. You know, your, your time investment is, you know, mm. if it doesn't work out, um, then yeah, it's not the best. But I suppose um, for people who love your videos as well, and like obviously they want to see more. I suppose because they only see those like one video that pops up every couple of weeks in their inbox, they don't necessarily think about the amount of time like you're actively working on the next one. Yeah, I try. I try not to sort of stress too much with the channel as well. Like it just is at this point. Like YouTube sort of is what it is, and you kind of get used to the fact that things go up and down. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, something I learned ages ago, uh, a peer rec said to me when we were talking about things is, you know, don't, don't look around at other channels, just focus on what you're doing. Don't worry what anybody else is doing. And it's really true because, you know, a lot of, um, you can get into your own head about sort of how your channel does or whatever. And the thing is at the end of the day, different audiences are different for different channels and there's always overlap, but what works for one channel is not what works for another. And those audiences will never cross over. So one person may grow very strong uh, very quickly because they have a different format, a different style, and it may appeal to a broader audience than another channel. Um, so, you know, I've seen, I've seen channels within the video gaming sphere because they focused on a specific format. They grew super fast and they overtook channels that were way bigger than them in the past. So it, it just, you know, things come and go and wax and wane with channels like that. And it's just... Uh, I find the best thing is to just not stress about this. So if it, whenever I post out a video, because they're long form as well, you have to understand if you drop like a 90 minute video, somebody might look at that, but they're having a busy day. They're not going to just immediately watch that video. So it may be that people don't watch your video two or three days. So I often will find that when I post a video, um, it may only be four or five days later where I sort of really get a feel for whether it's doing pretty decently or not. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think the one thing with YouTube is I did find that uh, they sort of change things around a bit and uh, how a video does in the first sort of 24 hours does matter. You know, it, it will get recommended more if it does very well because YouTube obviously thinks, wow, this video is doing great. We'll recommend it more. But even then, you'd be surprised if things just kind of go along and people are continuously watching that video, YouTube will notice that as well. They'll notice like, oh, there is actually an audience that's retained for this this video and stuff like that. So. Yeah, we've seen the same sort of things echoed with the podcast episodes. We've had some that have even someone posted a few weeks ago that will yeah. be outperforming. I'd say, uh, like, luckily, for, like our baseline views are just steadily going up. But then mm -hmm. every three or four episodes, there'll be one that just like spikes. Like, yeah. And we've had the one a couple of episodes ago that just like quadrupled what we would have expected it to do, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, which, uh, or even more, I think, probably now. Yeah. I haven't even looked. But like, um, so it's interesting. Yeah, the thing's getting like sucked into the algorithm and, and, and spat back out. 
Yeah, I mean, we're not without getting too heavily into talking just about like YouTube and stuff like that. I think there are so many variables, and honestly, at the end of the day, the best thing is just do the best you can, and then just see where it goes, and mm. you know, try yeah. and make decisions as you go along. You know, I think if you want to grow a YouTube channel, the best thing you can do is focus in on one specific thing and push that as hard as possible. But at the same time, if it's sort of just going along and it's not doing the best or it's not growing how you thought, maybe experiment, try something else. You know, it's it's the, yeah. you just got to keep trying things until you find a way forward, really. Big news, tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. So let's uh, dig our teeth into the, the main topic then. So we wanted to talk about, uh, with all of your law knowledge, where someone who's not as familiar with the law might find an entryway into that, maybe with some specific stories. Obviously, the Black Library is absolutely massive now, and there's so many entry points. If you're someone who's maybe been painting for a while, or you're looking for some sort of entry point, maybe you're new to this like entirely, uh, Warhammer in its entirety, what do you think are some good entry points for people to start, maybe some some book series that they can look into or maybe some like law videos of yours that are the best places to start i think it'd be interesting as i was well. gonna say yeah you're not allowed to just say go and watch your channel it. yeah i was gonna say i can't just I can't just sell no promos. do it do it yeah. although i would recommend it you're not allowed to use yeah. that as your answer. but yeah. i would be interested as well if it differs for like maybe if you're someone who's a painter if there's like something that might be more suited to them or maybe for somebody who's really into gaming maybe there's a story that's more about you know battle strategy or something mm. well i think if you are absolutely brand new to Warhammer, like maybe you've got a friend who just sort of plays it or recommends or that you should check it out or whatever. Um, unpopular opinion, actually, but I do think probably one of the best places to start is actually just the rule book for 40K mm -hmm. um, or maybe White Dwarf because White Dwarf's fairly inexpensive. So you can just pick up a White Dwarf and you'll get like a general feel of things, usually in White Dwarf. But they tend to cover a lot of different things mm -hmm. and you might find elements there that are interesting to you. Um, but the rule book uh, really contains the best summary of the law. Um, it obviously touches on the factions in a fairly brief overview way, but it also talks more broadly about what 40K is. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only thing with recommending the rule book is obviously it's not the most inexpensive place to start. No. Um, and I've always thought it would be a good idea if they did like a sort of law summary like a sort of supplementary book that you could buy that was just an overview summary for sort of beginners or something like this. Well, that's, what, that's what they used to have, isn't it? In second ed, second ed yeah. had the three books. You had the War that's Gear it. 1, the yeah. Rules, and then you had the awesome, it was the, it was the Imperialist well, yeah, yeah. book that was the one which was... I suppose it's not very sexy to like want to start with a rule book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, and the other thing is, is obviously there's different areas to 40k you've got the game you've got the painting you've got the law so somebody might not be at all interested in the you know so so the rule book is in some ways uh, it's like yeah from a just a objective point of view like it contains the best summary of where things are at uh, but yes you could go to youtube and you could just look at a law video you know there's there's many beginner guides i've got a beginner guide most channels that do law have a 40k where to start what is 40k beginner's guide and that will give you the sort of bare bones of what it's all about you know mm. but from there i always say it depends you know it depends if you're a big reader i mean some people coming into the law or coming into just 40k in general you know whether you're a painter or whether you're a tabletop player, most people will get some book at some point. But mm -hmm. again, it depends whether you're a big reader or not. You know, some people are not. But it's good. That's why we have audiobooks as well now. So, Do you find that some books translate better to audio than others? Yes, I think so, definitely. I think sometimes, I, I think character-driven stuff translates much better than just sort of... Uh, event-based stories which focus more on sort of you know what is occurring and I, th I think that's because the voice actors like they, yeah. they 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 feel the the, the 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 persona of the character and they feel the emotion of the situation or, or, or what's happening in that specific scene i think that conveys better in an audio rather than you just assuming it from reading the paragraph i think i think yeah. sometimes having i found the, i found the opposite true right. sometimes though because some of the audio books i've been listening to and i've not been able to really get into it right i've i've got potentially controversial opinion <laughs> when I'm like listening to an audio book, I don't really want them to do like 
character voices and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to read the book. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want like. I don't, don't want do you know like why five I like different it? voices to keep track of. Do like. you know why I like that though? Because it, I find it easier to keep, if I forget someone's name, remember the voice. Oh, I remember oh, the, the voice. voice. Yeah. yeah, but sometimes like the voices are funny and they're not supposed <laughs> to be funny. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think what off. I prefer is for them to, I, for me, just personally, for audiobooks, I prefer if they just adjust the tone of their own voice to be like higher, That's lower perfect. things, yeah. that would rather be perfect, than yeah. specific voices. I also have found it slightly off-putting sometimes where, you know, they will have like various characters and they, you know, one's got like a Yorkshire accent, one's got an East End accent. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I don't know, it just feels kind of I found that in the, uh, in the Heresy audio books when they do the um, the Space War, the sort of like Nordic accent comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it's a bit too on the nose. I'm not even necessarily but... talking just about the no, Warhammer no, no. books. By yeah, the way. I'm sure. just talking in general audio books. But yeah, they do it a lot in the Heresy books and they like the voices and the things like that. Yeah. I think, you know, just a small tangent, because I'm famous for tangents. Um, <laughs> we were talking earlier about sort of how did I get into doing like, you know, the law videos and, and sort of stories. And, and yeah, so often people say to me, like the sort of pacing actually of the way I talk in the videos and so forth, that is something that people like, the sort of pacing of how mm. I space out between words or telling things or or the emphasis that I put onto words, you know, choosing, you know. And um, I think I've thought about that a lot and it brings me back to actually, I think where that comes from or the sort of enjoyment I get with that was from um, Tony Robinson mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And Tony Robinson, he was, very, he was, is very good at telling stories and mm -hmm. speaking. And I remember as a kid, there were many TV series where he would just be telling stories on the TV. But he did it always, Tony Robinson, in a very animated way. Yeah. You know, he'd come in and he'd be like, the, the man came down from the cliff and he went through the things. And, you know, and he had that kind of really animated vocal way of speaking. But his pacing, you know, he knew when to sort of go quiet, yeah, yeah. to push it forward, not just... The man came along and then he went to the thing and then this happened and then this happened. You know, he would sort of emphasize elements and it's like that really helps convey a story. You know? That's exactly it. It conveys that emotion or sentiment of that scene or, or however it is. And I think that's the thing that I really like. Without doing audience. character voices. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, personally, I, I, I listen to any audio book. I guess it saves me having to obviously read it mm. specifically. But, um, but, uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I do think that I've read a lot of the books but I do prefer listening to the audiobooks. I think personally, I think it's a really good way to absorb it and all the law and everything whilst being able to do painting. Well, with, that's to... what, with the pillar thing. Like if you're a painter and you want to start picking up the law, audio, audio is fantastic because better. you can keep doing the thing you already like and like introduce this other pillar of the hobby. Yeah. But I would say also they, some people don't like short stories, which is fine. It's just a personal preference. Some people don't like short stories, novellas, anthologies. People don't like that. But I always think it is a good place to start uh, if you're new, because trying to like slog your way into a heresy book, if you're brand new to it, it, it can work for some people. No, you know, no, the first right. four, the first four books in the heresy series are known as being very, very solid books. Um, I think Joe actually spoke about that last week. I said that um, I first tried to pick them up really early on, and I, there was a, there was an assumed level of knowledge that I didn't have. Usually, people, exactly. usually people hear about from others, and they, you know, people ranting about it, talking about heresy. It's this big thing, and yeah, so you feel like, oh, this is the place to start. You get into it, and yes, th this is the big problem with forty k, and this is why I often repeat stuff in my videos. I get a lot of comments sometimes from people being like, oh, you've told us this like ten times. Yeah, but if you have watching that video for the first time and you've never heard about this before, you don't know that detail. Exactly. And yeah. I actually think it's actually very beneficial to go back and refresh yourself with, because there's so much lore. It's very easy to forget things and it's worth going back and refreshing your memory and re reinstate, restating stuff to your, you know, your memory just again and again. No, exactly. And then the perfect example, like I gave like my, my dad, I tried to get my dad to read the books and like he, he was like yeah, getting through the first one. And there came to a bit where it was like, oh, and, that, and the, Space Marine or whoever spoke into the Vox, and my dad was like, "What the hell is Vox?" Like, you know, that, it was little and, things and, like that. And, it, yeah. and he was like, "But, but they're not." Uh, so, but it, it the, good, the good thing about them is that it does, as you read through them, stuff then start you, you from the way that it's written or the way that it's conveyed in the audio book. You then start lining the dots up and going, oh, "It must be like radio, or it must be like your communications, or whatever." You do, you do kind of pick that up as you go through. But I think you, you are quite right. Like, it's I a think, bit of a chore though if you like have not enough going in. 
Like I found, no, that no, I could, yeah, yeah, I agree. But but the, the short stories are really good. Like like you're, like you're saying is it's like it gives you that snapshot um, about a certain situation or faction or character or whatever, and it has a nice beginning, nice middle, nice end. It's really concise. Gives you a real good insight into that faction or that specific character or whatever. Um, and they almost tie back to the little short story things in that used to be in White Dwarf or used yeah. to be in articles. You you can imagine one of those as like a really quick snippet of that yeah. specific. Uh, character or whatever blah blah yeah but um but they yeah. also again see it's different now for me than it would have been years ago because in the second edition and also like for example the third edition the rule book third edition rule book had a lot of law mm-hmm. like and i think fourth as well fourth edition um because years later i bought those as like just for myself like found the special editions of them and those third third edition fourth edition rule books have got a stack of law in like really law heavy um, so if you had those, if you were just into 40K or Warhammer at the time and you're just reading those, you could learn a lot. The modern rule books, they do have that stuff in there, but not quite so much detail. But um, yeah, whenever people ask me, like, where's the best place to start if you're new to it? I often say there is no best place and people hate that answer, but it's true. <laughs> no, but, you you know, when I started, when a lot of people I know started, they just would, you know, here's, here's a white dwarf. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and they just have to find your own way. It's a puzzle. You, you just know? sort of start wherever you have to start or whatever, whatever you had to Yeah, have. And, and also for for many years, like I was trying to sort of find my way in how do I order stuff? How do I organize things? Now I don't, I don't consider spoilers a thing in 40K. Like I just don't. I don't care. I, I will happily learn the end of a story first. It doesn't matter to me at all. And, and some people hate that, understandably. <laughs> I don't care at all. I don't consider there are spoilers in 40K. To me, it's just a big puzzle of information and you find out different bits at different times and you put them in the right place and it's just a big sort of, you know, jigsaw puzzle, basically. Do you think is that's because you can kind of almost like view it as history? I think that's like... Well, yeah, yeah. 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 So like if you're going to go, and, if you're a kid and you're learning about World War II, you're not going to be like, don't spoil it. Yeah, don't spoil <laughs> yeah. the end. Like. That, that, that leads exactly to what you were saying the other week, how like 40K is like, it is like science fiction, historical... Informa- that's what it's it is. almost got the same amount of of depth. detail and depth as actual history. But there's also like a insane. significant timeline as well, right? Yeah, but there is. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But think about it. You know, technically, the story is up to where Gilliman is on his crusade at the moment. You know, yeah. in M41, and that's that's what's happening. But then at the same time, we have just had the second book in the end of the death, which is 10,000 years previous. Yeah. So that's the thing with 40K, the story is all over the place. It could be told in the middle, at the end, things. And so it's there's a lot happening all at the same time. So again, it's just a personal thing for me. I don't really care. Like I'll read it anywhere. But that also may be because I'm so focused on the law and the stories. Other people want to read it in a different way. Not chronologically, um, like, yeah. yeah. But like you're saying with trying to recommend books to people, you have to preface it with, don't worry if some of it doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. It will eventually. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one thing. Obviously, the first three or four books in in the in the Heresy sort of series, you, you they are obviously in order, and you can read them. And I'd I'd recommend you read them in order. But but that, I think they are designed in that way that like you can pick up a specific individual book and be like. Like, yeah, I was reading through and then like, I think I was about four or five books behind and then they dropped Nemesis and I'm super into Assassin. So I was like, I was like, right, I'm going to read the Nemesis book. Um, you know, and you can do that with them, which I think is quite good. And it, it someone new to it can theoretically do that. But like you said, you know, yeah. there are going to be things that people are going to be like, well, what, 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 what is that? You know, don't, like, don't start with Master of Mankind. No. <laughs> <laughs> with that then, what is one of your other recommendations that you've got on your list then? So, I mean, I would go with, for the short stories, the anthologies, they just released the other day was the Galaxy of Horrors. Um, Lord of Dark Millennium was a good anthology. There was, so there are many different sort of anthologies. And again, easy ways to just go to Black Library and type in like anthology or, you know, or the novellas are good. Some of the mm-hmm. novellas like, uh, but again, some of the novellas can be very specific, like the Garrow one recently. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't recommend like the Garrow novella. You know, it's way too specific and it happens at this key moment and you have all the narrative first. It's like, again, I'm not caring about it from a spoiler point of view. It just will be better if you knew the other stuff first. Yeah, you know, yeah. You'll enjoy it more. That's, I think that's one of the things that not puts me off or has put me off, but like it definitely does feel like a barrier, the kind of um, the, the requirement to have quite a lot of like pretense to some of the stuff. Yeah. Or like certain things like, for example... I remember quite early on um, when I, once I got back into painting as a, a as an adult, um, I thought, oh, I better start like reading or listening to the audio books or whatever. Started the Horus Rising thing, and I was like, I didn't even really fully understand that there was a 
30 K and a 40 K yet. Yeah, like yeah. I'd just gotten back into 40 K and then I was listening to this book and I was like, well, you know, where's the tyranids and stuff? Like what's going on? Like what, <laughs> what is this? They're, like, they're on murder. It was so like, yeah. So certain things, like even within that, like I didn't even really know what 30 K was or Horus Heresy or whatever. I just got told that was where to start. That's the first book or that's whatever. I also think, uh, talking about anthology stuff, uh, things like Sanction and Sin from the Warhammer Crime series. That's interesting. The Warhammer Crime series does deal with like specific, uh, it's, it's set in one planet, but it bleeds into the wider Imperium. It's more human focused. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily have like space means dropping in everywhere, but it does sort of focus in and you get the feel for the Imperium. It could be an interesting point for somebody to start with because you're coming at it from a completely different perspective. So I think there's no right or wrong place. You'll find your own way eventually. And I, I think the reason why I recommend shorts to people more is because if you didn't like one story, you can try the next one and the next one, mm. the next one. Whereas if you go straight in with a big heavy book and you don't get on well with it, you might think, it's gonna oh, put you off. Yeah. yeah, there's not yeah. for me, you know, so. Uh, it's also quite an investment as well, isn't it? I suppose you're, you're more likely to persevere through a short story and get to the end and move on to the next one. Also, just think about how busy people are. You're going to work, you're dealing with a family at home, you don't have like, you know, you can read a short story in half an hour. You know, yeah. it's like going out, you can get on the train to go to work and you can read it and be done. You can read another one coming back, you know, it's much more digestible. Whereas a massive book, like, yeah, it's, plus you've got to carry it around. Or <laughs> then you go to e-reader or whatever, you know. So. <laughs> What's one of your favorite sort of uh, topics that the books explore, like in terms of not necessarily faction, but like, is there a specific type of story that like pulls you in personally? I like stuff which deal, obviously people will know that like, I like stuff which deals with the duality of the Imperium. Um, so one of my recommends always for people is Valdor, Birth of the Imperium. Mm -hmm. One, because it's a novella length, it's not super long, so it's quite digestible. It deals with a lot of different concepts and elements and story and characters in it. Um, again, I can't like spoil it too much, but it does deal with sort of the beginning of the Imperium. It has some stuff to do with the Emperor and uh, the Custodes and the sort of the beginnings of what is, I guess, like the Administratum and the Imperium in there and the sort of bureaucratic structure of the Imperium and how it kind of fundamentally doesn't really work, even right from the start. Um, and it deals with the sort of hypocrisy of, of the Emperor and the characters in there and sort of the Imperium and... Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting story. It deals with some pretty big things which are applicable just to the wider law. So you get a lot in that one story. Um, and again, can't really go into it too hard, but obviously Valdor is a character which comes back again later in other stories. And so you can always try to connect the dots and be like, well, was it this event which made him feel like this, 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 and, you know, something. But yeah, it, it gives you a good overall feel about lots of different elements that are within 40K and the Imperium. So yeah, Valdor is a good one. Um, so is there any others other than Valdor that you would put forward? I think to sort of mix it up again, if you were coming in new, because again, I think there's no real perfect place to start. So you could really throw things in the mix. Um, brutal Cunning, because it's fun and mad. And <laughs> it's orcs. I think there's like, I, I, it's been a while since I've read it, but I think, I think an orc like crashes his, uh, buggy straight into a titan head and then they like <laughs> take, so i was just spoiling it a little bit but like i again I, I, I sometimes when i'm talking about 40k i forget that spoilers i think completely. <laughs> yeah. so i just start telling people stuff and they're like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Like, you know. but um no brutal cunning it's a really good book because it has sort of you know a human world like the mechanicus planets a forge world and the orcs coming in so you have like the orc perspective there's a lot of sort of orc politics involved as i remember orc politics yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah there's there's a bit of orc politics involved and then you have the mechanicus point of view so it, it, you know literally a pov from the mechanicus so going from that to orcs is quite hilarious so there's sort of the <laughs> yeah. order versus chaos like it's it's really interesting but it it does give you a little snapshot also more into the mechanicus and sort of how they operate and what they do and and it you know it shows them it fighting in combat which is really interesting with like mechadendrites and how powerful they are and what they're capable of so it's a really interesting one just from giving you different perspectives and it does give a real 40k feel even though you don't have like space marines going on and all sorts of stuff like that yeah it's really it's a, it's a good one the criticism i hear a lot is that like the space marines are one of the less interesting uh sort of chapters to explore that's something that I've, i'm not sure how popular that opinion is but that's something i sort of hear thrown around a lot do you find that like some of the because obviously they get a lot of attention, like both in terms of miniatures and in terms of stories. Do you find that 
the other factions are maybe a bit more interesting to digest? I think I think other factions can be interesting to digest. I think comically, uh, even the space marines, some of the space marines themselves can be critical of the space marines and how boring <laughs> they like how they can be sort of objectively boring. Um, because I think I recall like in the um, I think it's the White Scars Primark book when Jakarti Khan and his sort of uh, aides when they're first learning uh, that they have the access to being in charge of the space marines and, and uh, the Khan is sort of speaking to his entourage and saying like, what do you think about these space marines? And they're basically saying to them, yeah, they're just sort of lumbering and they rely too heavily on their armor and they just sort of plow forward the legion. They're, you know, basically describing how the space marines just sort of charge forward and they rely on their armor. And then when they get close, they blow everything apart. And the Khan is like, right, we're going to stop that right now. <laughs> you guys need to do my plan and we're going to be fast. I'm going to attack. And it's going to be blades. And it's like, you know, he completely reshapes things. Um, I think there's a great bit in that Primark book of Jagati Khan as well, when uh, they're presenting him with like a Gloriana battleship. <laughs> and um, the Mechanicus representative is like, yes, this beautiful ship that we've spent, you know, 5% five, 5 of Mars's resources constructing it or whatever. And then Jagati Khan turns around and goes, it's shit. This is what you need to do. He's like, strip out these drives. It's too slow. I don't care about this. Go back and I want it done in this period of time. And the Mechanicus is like having a breakdown because they, they're like, I think the Mechanicus even says to him like, it's impossible. And he's like, make it happen. Like it's, it's a really, really good. So yeah, even the space means can be critical of space means, but yeah, it, it is a frustrating thing actually that the Xenos don't get so much airtime. Um, I'm sure everybody has like a specific Xenos. I really want the story told from a Tyranid point of view. <laughs> Why don't we have that? Like I want the sort of a hive mind. It's always, I remember that they're always, it could be really abstract. It'd be just fun to do. You do you think it'd be yeah. hard to do though in the sense yeah. of like yeah. language? <laughs> like, it'd be no, really they, hard. They, I remember whenever you had, I remember specifically like in one of the old Tyranid uh, codexes, there was a, a set, little short story about the Red Terror and it wasn't written from the Red Terror's perspective. It was written about the Red Terror. So they, they always seem to be, because they are a hive mind and all collective, you don't really have it always seems like it's a third person telling the yeah. story of what they did. I remember a short, it may not have been a short story. It might have been just even like a little narrative element within like the war gear or I can't, I can't remember where it was from. Oh God, people are going to go out on me now. Cause I always say to people like, show your re reference. Like, yeah. I can't remember. I'm sorry. But, but it's this short, it's this short where I think for the first time they're discovering tyrannid weapons and it's like a flesh bore or something. And they think it's just this organic weapon. And they're saying, and I think the, 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 the tyrannid weapon starts psychically controlling them and the characters involved end up like he starts killing other humans because the weapon is like psychically creature, controlling him. Yeah, yeah. It, it, although it's a weapon, it's still like a part of the Tyranid and it has its own independent sort of psychic ability. And so they realize, no, it's it's part of a bigger whole. I think that's when they first realized the concept of sort of synapse. Yeah. I think that's when they discover that. Yeah, that's awesome. I never even knew about that short. I yeah, think. I can't remember where it is. After. You know I'll look it, it up. If you know where it is, put it in the comments. Yeah, <laughs> I'll look it up. It's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other one that I would go for is always, uh, I've said so many times, Belisarius Call the Great Work. Um, it, it does throw you in the deep end a bit as a beginner, especially when you especially when you get into Call and what's going on with him and his backstory. And it does also jump around the timelines, which is super confusing. A lot yeah. of 40K books do that. A lot of 40K books start with a character in the sort of more contemporary time and they jump back like 8,000, 10,000 years to when a different character was doing something which relates to it. And that is actually a pretty jarring concept. It is, yeah. I've, I've read that one. I think it, it's... They do it in many books. It's, it's a great it's a great book. And because obviously Belisarius has been alive mm. so long, it, that book, it, you've got 30K aspects, 40K aspects. You've got like loads of different bits in it but yeah. without spoiling it too much. But it, it, it does jump around a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's good. It's it's good because it gives you a feel of things, how they were in the past mm. and where they get to and then the contemporary time. Um and Call is just an interesting character. So yeah, there is there is a lot to it, but that is a great, a great book. Again, it's one of those ones where if you don't mind just being thrown into it mm. and you just sort of let it come as it does, then you know, you'll get on well with it. All, all I'll say as a teeter is is alpha alpha primus is what every space marine should be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Read the book and you'll but see yeah. what I mean. Yeah, Belisarius yeah. Call, the great work. It's it's like you really need to check it out. And if you haven't already, you do need to check it out. It's a really good one. Bit of a bit of a curveball. I'll just tack on the end of that. Obviously, the, the purpose of this topic is for beginners or people who aren't as familiar with the law to get into it. 
have you got just to provide value for some people who are maybe a bit deeper in the law? Maybe they're sort of a intermediate sort of a law follower. If there's some, they've watched all your videos. Yeah, they, they know what they're talking about. But <laughs> I, I think a deep like cut or something. I think if you are established into the law, then going for like an omnibus series is really good. Mm. Word bearers. Uh, Night Lords, Omnibus series, any of these kind of things, or just like the Oriel Ventress series and stuff like that. I mean, those are all sort of obviously Space Marine heavy, you know, but, you know, any any of the very well-established series, whether you go to like Gaunt's or something like that as well, you know, they're all very different. Some people don't like Gaunt's Ghosts. It's too character-driven for some people. You know, they don't feel like there's enough events going on. I suppose it depends on the type of book you like in general as well. Yeah, I mean, that's you touched the other on this earlier, like, what sort of reader are you? Like, maybe you're someone yeah. who, like, really likes crime novels or, like, mystery or... Yeah. I, I, I just want to say that the uh, the Abaddon one, uh, Talon Horus, yeah. and the other one, that for me was amazing. I mean, Aaron Dembski Bowden is a great, great writer anyway, but... Um, the way that you see that's the first time you probably see the other side of of of, of like the whole thing with Imperium and Chaos. It's the first time you see well, Chaos Space Marines aren't just aren't just evil. They actually are individuals, and they all have things they don't like. The, the character side of it's amazing in that. So the omnibus I demons think, have feelings too. Yeah, that's demons have feelings. That should be a bumper say. sticker. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bumper sticker. Yeah, for the rhino. <laughs> for, for the, the rhino. rhino. Yeah. <laughs> The people, uh, I've just thought of this, but like, there's no way it's not a thing. But there must be bumper stickers. People like, we'll must have put bumper, bumper stickers. stickers. Yeah, yeah, on on rhinos. Oh, yeah, rhinos. On rhinos. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's no way someone hasn't done that. That is definitely on the back of a T Sun's rhino. Demons are feeling safe. <laughs> it's got to be. I think another good one. If you are maybe again, if you've read like Chaos Space Marines or just Space Marine books and like the Heresy series, and you're like, where do we go from here? Again, omnibuses are good, but you know what would be a really good one is Path of the Eldar. Mm-hmm. Path of the Eldar, you can't go wrong with that's Path of the Warrior, Path of the Seer, Path of the Outcast, and they do it as an omnibus series. Um, really highly recommend from Gav Thorpe. Gav Thorpe writes a lot of the Eldar stuff. Um, and again, like we're saying, you know, obviously there is a focus on the Imperium a lot in a lot of the stories. It's a shame that some of the Xenos stuff doesn't get really pushed harder. Um, I think we know why, but it's a shame uh, because, again, the, the story of the Inari. This is why my Eldar Force is Inari, because I don't care how it is on the tabletop. They are the most interesting faction to me. Like the story of what is going on with the Inari is super amazing. Mm. Um, and again, the, the Inari books like Wild Rider, which came out around 8th oh, edition, uh, I believe. Yeah, it was, when the codex, it was when the Codex came out, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, they, they could change 40K forever if they push that series forward. So I recommend the Inari books as well. Like really interesting. Maybe if you're someone who's a fan of an existing franchise, where could they find a bridge? I think sometimes there are obviously some which cross over better than others. You know, there are some things which are more applicable for for as much as people always talk about, oh, in 40K, there is this Dune thing or that Dune thing, or there are other elements and similarities between different verses. I mean, you get that in science fiction anyway. In science fiction, there's always overlaps between different tools, mechanics. There are established mechanics in science yeah. fiction which cross over. And all verses will have their own unique elements and they're more sort of, you know, blended elements and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, despite the fact that 40K and June actually obviously have some similarities, um, trying to translate, okay, if you like June, what 40K book or novel or story do you go to is pretty challenging. Um, I think one of the things we talked about was sort of Star Wars. Like if you were going to recommend something to Star Wars, that's pretty difficult because... You'd assume that there'd be so much overlap as well, like just with it being a, an established large sci-fi universe, right? Yeah. Something like Andor. If you were into Andor, I think the Warhammer Crime series yeah. would be very applicable. But if you're talking about Star Wars in a bigger sense, what you're talking about is rebels fighting a big empire, which of course the empire can be the Imperium and your rebels can be your rebels. Mm. How many books are there about rebels? Not that many. No. Um, I think I thought of one which was like Shadow Sword, but that's focused on a tank crew. But it does take place in a scenario where there's a planet that's rebelling and they do learn about different opinions of the Imperium and different things like that. It's quite an interesting story for what is basically, I mean, it's a Guy Haley book, so it's, 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 it's good. Really good yeah. The thing is, I've been trying to remind people of this fact for a while that actually the Imperium's biggest problem is humans, not the Xenos and stuff. Yes, the Tyranids are about to destroy a whole galaxy, but that's like a, a distant Small threat. fish, that yeah, galaxy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> let's not worry about that for yeah, now. We'll deal with, we'll cross that bridge later. Um, now, the Imperium is always having, people often say like, oh, why don't planets rebel? I, I think this actually speaks to how little 
is actually written to this because people are always saying, oh, why don't planets rebel against the Imperium? The Imperium is this huge, horrifying authoritarian bureaucracy which doesn't value human life, you know, and it just happily spend human lives like they're nothing, you know. Why don't people fight back? They do. It's just not written about very much. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a reason why the Sororitas and the Imperial Guard are very widespread all around the the galaxy and you know a, a rebelling planet having to deal with sororitas that's terrifying you know they're they're armored as you know well as space marines they have like flamethrowers and they come in and they are like you know they're more brutal perhaps than space marines in their opinions about things because they're ecclesiarchy yeah. so if you don't follow that line like that you're done yeah you're done and it's yeah. in, in a, well in a horrifying fashion um i think i remember that in, in a book uh, i think it is something we'll talk about in a minute it was one of the um I think it was one of the Dawn of Fire books um, where they capture, it's an ordinary human, technically innocent, but sort of was forced into a cult, like a chaos sort of cult. Um, and some of the other humans that are around are like, whoa, whoa, what's, what's going on in there? And the Surotas are like, don't worry about it. You don't want to see, like, and <laughs> they're sort of torturing her, like very horrifyingly to sort of, you know, so the Surotas don't mess around. Um, but uh, yeah, so when you're talking about rebellion and, and what would mirror Star Wars, Unfortunately, there isn't very much. Um, you have like, obviously like Krieg, Badab, stuff like that. Yeah. Again, people that know the law will know what I'm talking about, but it's basically planets which have rebelled or have rebellions occurring within them. The trouble is there is a book about, there is a book called Krieg, you know, and it obviously nods to some of that stuff, but it's more contemporary. It doesn't speak to the past, the, the past of it. And it all sort of alludes to it. Um, really to know that you need to get into the Imperial armor books and, and, Unfortunately, again, they're Forge World books that are out of print. Where can you read that stuff? I don't know if Warhammer Plus are doing the Imperial Armour books. I think they are on there. I think they are. Yeah. I mean, this is another small tangent. This is why I always think campaign books are worthwhile getting. I always get campaign books because they've gone like that. And they hold a wealth of, of law. They, they usually have a stack of law, which is only there, and it will never be anywhere else, and you need to get it. So yeah. that's why I always get campaign books. So what you mentioned, you mentioned uh, June. Was there any... I think the thing with Dune is obviously it's this space opera. Mm -hmm. It's the scale. To me, if you really distill it, Dune is about scale and what is occurring with all these different worlds and the sort of, you know, the, the, yeah. it, it's not it's not like a story which is set just in a singular planet and deals with that planet or, you know, it's not talking about sort of, it's not like uh, an Ian Banks book or something like that. You know, it's not that style. It's, it's you know, um, so I think if you're going to recommend anything for me, I have thought about it. People might not like this opinion. I actually do think that the Dawn of Fire series might be, you know, might work. It's not comparable to June. I'm not saying that. Like it's not. It's, <laughs> he's, it's, he's it's preempting the comments. He no, knows what just, he's dealing with. I just want to share my thinking is like the, the reason I think the Dawn of Fire series is worthwhile is because it deals with Gilliman coming in. It deals with the sort of structure, the scale of the Imperium you get this impression of what it is about mm -hmm. and what is occurring. And specifically, I would say when I say Dawn of Fire series, I'm talking about the first three books because the first one is about, you, you do get this feeling of like what Gilliman is doing, what he's trying to do, how he's trying to take things in and move things forward. I guess even like Dark Imperium to a little degree gives you that as not to a little degree, to a good degree, it gives you that. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why Dawn of Fire is because, yeah, so you get that scale in the beginning, the very epic, the structure, all of that. Um, it deals with the sub-factions. You've got things like rogue traders, the Navy commanders. You sort of get that feel. And then obviously it gets into the main sort of story. Uh, so, so it does have that sort of scale feel, which I think for me is how I always felt June. I've read June ages ago mm. and a couple of the other books as well. But for me, the sort of scale of the space and the interactions between all the worlds and the, the sort of dis different factions happening there, those are the key things. But then as you go into like the second book for Dawn of Fire, um, Gate of Bones, it becomes much more about the struggle to survive and, you know, to hold on to a planet, the fighting which is occurring. And in a very 40K way, the different factions, the different characters there. And and honestly, I mean, I, I've heard from people sort of who are, you know, I've heard people say that they're not really, uh, that they didn't want to start on the Dawn of Fire series because it's new. And somehow it kind of, they get the impression that it's not as strong as maybe the Heresy series. But I wouldn't agree personally. I mean, I've, I've been going through it and I've really enjoyed it. Um, and Gate of Bones is surprisingly probably one of my favorite 40k books. I don't really like doing favorites for anything, mm. but it was really strong. Um, I really like the characters. I really like the sort of 
you know, just the, the narrative through it. I like how it occurred and what was going on. So again, without sort of talking too much about it, Cade of Bones just on its own, I would recommend highly. But um, I mean, try, trying really to distill one verse to another and what books would recommend, it's, that's really difficult, especially with something like June. But, you know, if you push me to it, that's probably the way I would go. But there are many, many options, of course. So I, I, really, I really like the two Blade Runner films. I think just the way that they, they are and the way they're portrayed. So, and do you see anything for someone who likes that kind of dystopian kind of like setting? Do, what, what do you... There's a lot of dystopian stuff in 40K, but I think Warhammer Crime would run away with it for that. Yeah, yeah. You could go with any different one. I guess Grim Repast is very good. Mm. I mean, Bloodlines is good. I would probably, if you wanted something that was more comparable, not comparable because it's not really, but like, because... Of, there's a reason why you can't be comparable to Blade Runner because AI and, and yeah. AI is not a thing in 40k. <laughs> not a thing in 40K no. um, but Flesh and Steel, uh, I really enjoyed Flesh and Steel. It's probably one of my favorite Warhammer crime books. Um, it deals with obviously uh, the Mechanicus as well as the human elements, mm -hmm. and it deals. It, it's kind of interesting Flesh and Steel because it deals with humans having to sort of be exposed to the Mechanicus in a way. I think it also describes. Um, one of the rare examples where it describes the process of becoming a servitor mm -hmm. in brief. It's not, it's not pleasant, um, <laughs> but like, yeah, no, the, the characters, uh, it's, it's Simeon Noctis and row one Lux. So you have a human mechanicus combo and there's the detective element, which is like the first sort of blade runner. Movie I do really think the crime this. aspect of, of it has been, there's really something really good that they've brought to the, the, yeah. the stories and stuff. People for the longest time wanted a sort of more human mm. angle to go down into hive cities and um yeah varan gentra also just as a planet oh i think the planet is electo i think uh varan gentra is the hive city um but um yeah the hive city that warhammer crime is set in is really interesting in and of itself mainly because the people that live there don't believe that xenos are a thing uh because they're How never of them. i love that <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting and it, it, again it's it speaks to the sort of humanness of the planet and and sort of this snapshot of the Imperium and, you know, there, there are many planets within the Imperium who don't believe that Xenos are a thing because they've never seen them. All they hear is like off world stories, mm -hmm. which could be just, you know, you know, just, just children's stories. It's, you know, scary stories. It's all these things that'll come out of the darkness and take you away and do horrible things to you, the Drakari. And it's like, oh yeah, whatever. You know? <laughs> If only they knew. Yeah, exactly. You know, that can't be real. Yeah, like, be, I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, Alien was one of the ones that I had on my list as well. That seems like one of the sort of one to one. Should have some crossover with the right? Tyranids, I mean, surely, come right? On, like, yeah, it's, it's the thing is, that, yeah, yeah. People always say that they always go to Tyranids. Yeah, there's not too many stories about Tyranids. I mean, there are, but you know, there's, but they're never, there's, as we said, they're never in the perspective of the Tyranids. It's, no, yeah, and I don't think comparable to Alien in the sense of finding a planet and then you know that kind of thing um i actually thought for me uh the oriel ventress series the first one nightbringer again not comparable in a direct way because mm. again it's very hard to find something that is specifically comparable the reason i thought of that story is because it deals with them arriving on a world to discover the horrors that are sort of secretly happening there mm. um also, as you know, people will know, eventually you get to Dead Sky Black Sun, which is terrifyingly horrifying and <laughs> deals with all sorts of body horror. And it's like that. That I mean, the, the Oriel Ventress series is probably one of the most body horror series that is in 40K. Oh, and that's why I thought, okay, if we're going with Alien and horrifying body things and stuff like that, you know, that's that's the way to go. I'm going to say that the, the Night Lord series... No, uh, as well. I think, up, I think that can put some gloves on and punch just as hard. It's pretty, if you enjoy it's, if you enjoy descriptions of flaying, yeah, I, yeah <laughs> you're, you're, you're it's, sorted. It's uh, it's yeah, it's quite a, 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 a specific taste. I think yeah, they're good. They're great books. Don't get me wrong, but um, but yeah, it's, so there's uh, someone out there listening right now who's like, oh, I love flaying. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> of, I'm the one for me. Thank God I listen to this there's podcast. A, there's a lot of details in Night Lords, but. Uh, it's just it's an interesting thing with 40k in general where i really i was talking to somebody the other day i really feel like this scope they've done warhammer crime they've got the horror series but that's for the sigma the sort of, right it's sigma yeah. it's like the warhammer fantasy side of things so i i really feel like there is scope for a 40k horror series which focuses more like the adventurous or the night lords and stuff and goes down that road i think you obviously have to like do it with um taste 
<laughs> yeah, or, or, or like <laughs> you need you need to structure the narrative well and sort yeah. of make it worthwhile. It can't just be like random gore. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it can be, but like <laughs> if it was a corn book, it might be. But, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. I think one of the most horrific examples, and I've noted this before, uh, especially when it comes to like Nurgle, is I, it's either in Dark Imperium or Plague War, the second book. Um, but it deals with like a, an Ultramar. I think he's the star commander or the port master of this, this vessel. And Typhus is watching as Nurgle like horrifyingly corrupts him. And the guy is just like, he's kind of captured in like a time bubble and he gets like rotted and then sort of it reverses and then he gets thing and like his, his spine like folds onto itself. <laughs> and the guy, and even though technically he should have been killed ages ago, Nurgle like keeps him alive so he can enjoy the feeling. And oh. this guy's like, you know, hating it. And then eventually like all these nurgling spill out of him and start eating him when you know things and then eventually like they sort of they're mopping up what's left of him and they, they sort of and then he becomes like he becomes like a portal or he transforms into like a herald of nurgle and that's so nurgle's been sort of using this guy to kind of create like a pathway through and yeah yeah oh, typhus great. is just watching and he's like wow nurgle really favors this man he's like, <laughs> He's this like lucky beautiful. guy. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, well, what I got to do to get some so, of this around there. Uh, yeah, but it, it's funny because I think uh, I remember I've seen people say to me before something like, oh, you'll never see anything like Dead Sky Black Sun again. And it's like, I don't know. Like, they, they do throw in from time to time these super, even, I mean, you know, the Dark Imperium series is pretty new. Um, so they do throw in still the horror there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, although obviously Nightbringer is not a direct comparison to Alien or anything like that, um, I think if we're thinking of like, okay, what's Alien? It's like a space horror oh, right, stories. Yeah. You know, that that's the way to go, I think. Um, I, I had one as well, just to round it out. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm not expecting there to be like a direct comparison per se. But one of the like popular things of like the last of what like five ten years has been, especially with um with the Last of Us, has been like these like zombie stories and this idea of like you know being sort of lone in this uh, post apocalyptic setting. Yeah, I think again, I would actually say like the sort of the Dark Imperium series because it deals with plague coming to a yeah. planet. I was going to say, I feel like the Death Guard might come up, or the Nurgle stuff might come up again yeah. with this yeah. one. I mean, there there are obviously others, um, but like uh, God Blight was really interesting as well. The actual, I have to say, for my personal Dark Imperium and then God Blight were the best two of that series. Um, plague War, it, it sort of went on a bit for me. I, I did actually find myself like going through chunks of that book quite quickly. Um, but the first, the, the Dark Imperium and, and uh, God Blight were really interesting. And they do handle sort of like, not necessarily zombies, but Nurgle plenty. Um, They're very similar. But I, I think also another thing, whilst obviously you have like, uh, obviously you have like the clickers and the sort of the, the blighted people in like Last of Us. Um, I think Last of Us is obviously also like an apocalypse story, like a sort of end of the world scenario. And so there's a lot of relationships, like very powerful, strong relationships. So when I was thinking about like, well, what kind of, what scenario do you have like strong relationships built within? Any number of like Imperial Guards stories. But something that I had revisited very recently was actually the Triumph of St. Catherine. Mm. Um, it's a Sororitas story. Now, very obviously not apocalyptic, not comparable in a direct way. But I think it mirrors the sort of, if you re if you listen to or read uh, Triumph of St. Catherine, I would recommend the audiobook for that as well. The performance of the narrator in Triumph of St. Catherine is really, really strong. Um, and it, one, really helps you to understand the sororitas, but also there's a lot of sort of emotional bond and sacrifice between, between the sisters in that story. And I think that for me is something which I would compare to something like an apocalyptic scenario where people are forced together and they have to learn about each other and bond together. And so for me, I would go, go that route. Um, but yes, or just any Nurgle story. So, <laughs> <laughs> so beyond sort of uh, entertainment, do you find that there's much of a, a use for law sort of beyond, you know, just, just listening to a book for fun? Have you found that it's maybe helped you with your painting or there's been sort of any, any other benefits in the hobby? I, I think law and just the stories can be genuinely pretty motivational, actually. Um, sometimes when I want to do some painting to a specific faction, mm -hmm. but I'm not really feeling it, um, I might go and listen to or read some law. Like I find it really spurs me forward. Like it really, you know, motivates me in a really strong way. Um, because I find sometimes actually with what I do, I'm often cross-referencing stuff and reading around different topics and I'm jumping around from different places to try and put information together or I do one thing and I move on to the next thing. But sometimes I find if you sit down and really read a story and you get fully immersed, you let yourself get immersed into it, 
same with like an audio book. If you listen to an audio book, by the end of it, it's like going to a movie. When you come out at the end, you feel sort of motivated by that story and the narrative. So I think sometimes like, you know, if you are stuck on a painting project, for example, you kind of hit a mental brick wall and you're just feeling demotivated, take a break away from the painting, you know, take a couple of days away from your painting, go and uh, listen to a couple of audio books, two, yeah. maybe two audio books in the same sphere or by the same author. And you might find that suddenly you're really inspired, you know, and obviously people listen to these things whilst they're painting in general, but sometimes I think listening to it separately. So, you know, cause you obviously, your level of concentration is very, very high when you're painting and maybe you don't fully take in the sort of emotional feeling, you know, maybe do something else or you know, walk and listen to the story. Or I've whatever. kind of gone over that before. I, I almost don't like listening to something that I'm too interested in while I'm painting because mm. I don't actually take the information in as well. You can zone out easily. Can't yeah, you? I agree. Yeah. Sort of, but um, and then I think always, if you're painting, painting is a very good thing for people's mental health because yeah. you can you really have to focus, and it's very sort of relaxing to sort of. Well, for some people, some people it's not <laughs> relaxing at all. But we hit two I, ends of the spectrum. But if you're listening to the podcast, it's probably quite right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think like law as well can be a really solid distraction for people. I've heard this a lot. You know, I've heard from loads of different people whether they've been in you know forces or whether they are like health professionals, any high stress job, being able to come away and like disconnect. And again, whether it's right at the end of your shift and you've got to commute back and you can have like an audio, but maybe, or, you know, another one is always like uh, people, long distance drivers and stuff like that, you know? And again, that's why people listen to the law channels as well, because they want to sort of have something <laughs> on the background. Uh, but uh, I think it's just a, a good thing that can distract you and take you away to another place, like any narrative it's story. It's escapism. Yeah. yeah it really yeah. helps. Yeah. Especially if it's something you're super passionate about as well. Yep. Um, I've, I've been there when, when I've, I've wanted to paint the project and I need some inspiration for it. I'll stick on a yeah. relevant, relevant audio book. We had a viewer comment. Um, I think it was on last week's episode, actually talking about like how to find motivation. If you've got a, if you're in like a bit of a rut. Yeah. Um, I suppose that speaks perfectly to that. Like maybe take a break from the painting and Does, listen yeah. to listen to an audio book. Yeah. Also talking about like, um, you know, how big 40K is and the law is. I think sometimes it can be good to just throw yourself to something which you maybe are not feeling or particularly interested in from time to time. Yeah. You know, because one of the things people always say is like, oh, if you're starting out where, you know, if you're starting out with 40K, how do you first build an army? How do you choose your first army to paint? And it's like, well, a couple of factors, isn't it? It's like, how simple is it? to paint to start with, but also go with what you just feel you enjoy. So my point is sometimes I find people choose a faction because they think it looks interesting. I've heard this many times. They, they're like, they gravitate towards a certain faction and that can be true. You can choose just visually like, Oh, these guys, I really like the look of them, you know, but then later maybe they listen to the law and they think, damn, the Necrons are really awesome. Like they are pretty cool. I wish I'd chosen that. So this is why I say that, again, it kind of comes back to what I said about the rule book, finding something, whether it's a law video on YouTube or whether it's like getting the rule book or just reading around the topic, maybe even just going onto a website and just reading the basics of like the different factions, try and find out a bit more about what they're about, yeah. not just visually and not don't, don't, don't just take your, you know, somebody just told you like, Oh yeah, they're just about this and about that. And yeah, that's basically it. You know, Go and do your own research, you know, try and find out because you might find that later. Yeah. The faction is really, you know, far more interesting than another, you know. If you're enjoying this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and review on whatever platform you're using and also choosing to follow and subscribe. It really helps us out and it helps us deliver these episodes to you for free every week. Now back to the show. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the podcast, then please submit it in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're on any of the audio platforms, please head over to our Instagram at Siege Studios. Our question this week comes from brilliant username. Certified loser says, <laughs> what is your favorite Space Marine chapter in terms of painting, lore, and or gameplay? This is a trick question. Like. <laughs> <laughs> James, you want to fire off? Look, it's, it's pretty... Pick, pick one for each. Don't just say Blood Angels for everything. <laughs> it's, 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 pick one for each. Uh, oh, is that what we had to do? I mean, you can That's pick not one how I read you it. You can do it that okay. way. Well, I'll, I'll go with the obvious. Obviously, painting is Blood Angels. The lore, I actually really, really like um, the uh, Iron Snakes massively. I've read those books when I was younger. I really, really like the Iron Snakes. Um, so it's painting, lore, and... Gameplay. Gameplay. Oh, gameplay. Um, I'm probably going to say, uh, it's controversial for me, but I'm probably going to say Death Guard because they just don't die. So <laughs> so, 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 there you go. That's a, Does that count? Chaos... 
Chaos yeah, they Marine were, they, chapter. Uh, didn't the question didn't? It said specific. Space Marine chapter. Didn't say Legion. <sighs> Iron Hands. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Iron Hands. I don't, I don't actually care. Yeah. Do you do there you go. You want. Yeah. Joe, have you got anything that comes to mind? Um, well, I kind of, I thought we were supposed to pick a chapter. You can pick a chapter. If there's one that hits that Venn diagram um, intersection. Well, I, obviously, the obvious one we talk about a lot is that like I like Dark Angels, but I didn't want to go for that because I've sort of spoke about a few times how like they're probably not actually even my favorite chapter. They're just out of the main out of your first foundings are definitely the most interesting to me. But I really like, when I was going to do a Space Marine Army, I combed through um, uh, the list of like uh, all of the chapters that have been mentioned in, in the books before and things like that. And I really wanted to find one that was an unknown founding, but had like a little bit of lore, a little bit of something I could go along with and also looked cool. And uh, I found the marines exemplar who look awesome there it's an all black body and red arms the like symbols just like basically a skull um it's sick and then the the aquila changes with the company that's color awesome. yeah so you can basically just put whatever aquila Coming color you want and say oh that's that company whatever it's pretty cool um they have like a tiny bit of law um a few notable characters and things. I think they might've been mentioned in one or two books briefly, but um, the kind of story that they have is that their chapter master went kind of over enemy lines in a, like a storm Raven and crashed. And they are now trying to find him. Basically they're kind of assuming that he's alive. It probably isn't, but um, that's kind of the brief little bit of story that you have with them. And I, I saw that and I was like, they look cool. That sounds cool. I like the little contained story and you can, with it. And you can paint the arms separate to the bodies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and I can do sub-assemblies. <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah. So they're, they're probably for me what I'm going to go with, I think. I'll do, uh, I'll do mine real quick. We'll save the best for last. But uh, I would say gameplay I can't touch on, unfortunately, because uh, I've not played any 40k. But uh, in terms of lore, um, while technically not a chapter, it's kind of like a legion, like you said, Jerry, uh, uh -huh. Sons of Horus, because I absolutely loved the first four books in the uh, uh -huh. Horus Heresy uh, well, it's not tri quadrilogy, I guess that is. <laughs> uh, absolutely love those. That made me like fall in love with just lore as a whole. Um, so that was my intro into that. I really loved the story. Um, and then in terms of painting, bit of a curveball. I'm painting a Dark Angel at the minute just for a bit of practice. And it's the most fun I've had painting this. I think it's because it's a, like a scheme I haven't really done anything of, like certainly not in a long, long time. And it's just been like really refreshing. I don't know why. I think purely just because I, I love think, painting marines but I don't think you've ever done any dark angels for us have you no not for siege no, no. I've done some yeah. like s a small handful of some before yeah. but um nothing like that matches one my current ability and two my current painting style but I found they just like mesh like so well mm -hmm. um not necessarily like my favorite like colors or anything but it's just been really enjoyable to paint that scheme cool Lutin, what you got for us what you got I think in terms of chapter for painting, it has to be Ultramarines. Good it has man. to be. It has to be. Good man. But, I mean, it's my biggest army. It's the army I started painting with, and I still am painting it. It's not, it's not finished. But also, there is an interesting part to it with the painting, which was that when I first did my Ultramarines army when I started as a kid, um, again, people did not have, like, massive amounts of paints available to them like they do now so mine was literally the enchanted blue oh, I, I got many of the enchanted blue and that's what my ultra means were so my ultra means are very blue like they are <laughs> they are they are not the the toned down sort of ultramarine blue that most people see uh, my army is pretty blue and more interestingly later obviously not so easy to get hold of enchanted blue so i've had to you know we come up with like a, a mixture of modern sort of paints i think it's like p3 and some vallejo yeah, in the mix there to make that combination but it marries up fantastic so i've managed to keep the continuity of my force going forward so that would be for the painting for the law i mean obviously like i find all the loyalist stuff pretty interesting but I think the stories, and I'm going to sort of overlap here a little bit. I think the stories of the Death Guard and the Night Lords particularly, you know, very, very horrifying, which I enjoy. 
Um, but also there is a lot of really curious elements. So like characters like Typhus, uh, hilarious and his relationship with Mortarion and sort of, you know, Kurz and his sort of spiral down and then what the Night Lords would become later. And then many of the details of their sort of, you know, <laughs> their, their atrocities. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, I, I think I really like the sort of, uh, dismissiveness of it where they're just sort of having conversation whilst doing whatever they're doing and it's just yeah it's it's very 40k you can't get much more 40k than night lords probably not. um and uh, just from a painting point of view they're probably one of the most annoying armies because of their just the, continue, lightning, the lightning, lightning everybody loves the lightning yeah. um obviously for gameplay that's like 10 percent for me um and it's usually other games like titanicus and necromunda for me more yeah. than actual 40k but that's going to change this year that's going to change but um, so everyone says every yeah year. <laughs> every year it's going to change for me now now i've got these knights so that's, that's that's the the way forward but um i think in terms of gameplay um probably go for corn go Good for choice. the world eaters run at people and hit them hard i enjoy i enjoy watching uh gameplay channels tabletop channels where somebody brings a world eaters army and everyone's like right okay <laughs> because they know what's coming at them and they know that this isn't going to be the usual gameplay you know yeah. they're going to have to sort of change it up a little bit and <laughs> when the corn berserkers get in the mix it always seems to be terrifying they seem to really shred through so yeah. it's an enjoyable army to watch i think so that's yeah. for me well, if you've made it this far to the end of the show, thank you so much for listening. And thank you, Lutin, for coming on this episode. Thank you very much. much. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thank if, you. God forbid, anyone hasn't heard of, uh, of your channel, where can they find you? You can find me at youtube.com forward slash Lutin09. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. We will catch you next week. Bye.